Hey everybody, it's Brooke from Mrs. Coghill Farm. And boy, that sun's bright. I thought I was gonna do this without my sunglasses, but I just can't do it. So here I am sitting on the porch and I've got two bags with me. One of them's a paper bag, one of them's a black garbage bag. Guess what I'm gonna be doing today? Take a peek in there. Yep. If you guessed freeze drying basil, then you are correct. I'm starting off at our farm, Coghill Farm, but after we pop this basil into the freeze dryer, we're not staying here today. We're going on a trip. But first things first, I got to get this basil off of the stems. So a friend, well, a follower who is local that has became a friend offered me this basil that she grew in her garden. And we, basil is something that we plan to grow in our potage garden in the back of our house, but that didn't happen this year because the potage garden isn't quite ready yet. So next year, hopefully we'll be able to grow our own basil, but this year I'm so thankful for Janet who graciously offered to bring me this basil and it's a garbage bag full, y'all. I hadn't even gotten out of the bag yet, so I don't know exactly what kind of um, condition it's in since it's been in this garbage bag from her place to mine, but I, I bet we can come up with enough to freeze dry. And basil is something that our family uses a lot of. Um, I'm hoping that I can use these as whole leaves and rehydrate them to put on pizzas and um, flatbreads and different things such as that. Uh, sun gold pasta is another example of something I like to use fresh basil for. And if that doesn't work out to where I can rehydrate the fresh leaves, then I'll just grind it and I'll have uh, fresh dried basil. So it's a win-win no matter how this turns out. But first things first, that's what I have the paper bag for. I'm going to pull the leaves off of the stems and put them in the paper bag. And from the paper bag, we'll go to the sink and we'll wash them and put them on the trays, pop them in the freeze dryer. So why am I outside? Well, first of all, I see some little, some little critters crawling around. She grew this organically. She did not use any pesticides or chemicals. And we all know that in nature, there are critters. And um, I don't want to bring any of those inside the house. So I'm going to pull the leaves off outside and rinse them off. And that way I won't be introduced to anything that we don't want inside the house. So I just grabbed the first stem out of the bag. And you can see that I've got to do some sorting. And the leaves have wilted a little bit just from being in the plastic bag, but that's not gonna deter us from using them. We're just gonna pull them off one by one and put them in this brown bag to where I can get them to the kitchen sink and rinse them off. And you can see there's there's quite a minute little, it's gone to flower and some of those flowers are, are falling off. And so that's another reason I didn't wanna bring it in the house that was gonna create just a mess that I don't want to have to clean up later. But boy, this is beautiful. And I am so thankful to have this because basil is something that I've been wanting to try to freeze dry. And I thought it was going to be next year. So don't wish away too fast. My, I'm getting quite a bit off of this one plant and there's multiple stems in here. It might not look like 
that much inside this bag, I'm here to tell you, it is. I think you'll be able to tell when I get it all spread out and washed exactly how much it is. But look at all the stems that I pulled it off of. Now, I did not get any of the leaves that had any brown on them or any um, evidence of insect damage. But uh, I'm telling y'all, I'm very impressed with the amount that I got. So let's get it cleaned up and put it in the freeze dryer. All the basil is washed and laid out to dry. Isn't it beautiful? And it's, it's a lot more than what I thought it was initially. So this may make two batches, but if it does, that's okay. I'll just pre-freeze four trays and pop four trays in the freeze dryer and that way it can all be getting ready. Okay, so I have uh, four trays filled up and you can see how much I have left. I'll just go ahead and put what's left over on some trays in the freezer so that way it won't wilt on me and it'll be ready to go once this batch comes out. The question that I get asked often is if there was an accessory to the freeze dryer that you should buy that, that I would recommend, what would that be? And that is an extra set of trays because just like I mentioned, I'll be able to have this basil ready to go in the freeze dryer when the first batch comes out. If I didn't have that extra set of trays, then I couldn't do that. So an extra set of tra trays is a must if you are purchasing a freeze dryer. So I told you guys that we were leaving the farm and headed to another farm, but I didn't tell you where. So I'm on my way to see Catherine at G&G &G Farm, which is just a little piece from our house, but I'm excited for Catherine to show y'all and tell you what her new, I don't know if you call it a project or her new adventure is. So y'all come with me and we'll go see Catherine. Well, here I am. I'm at G&G &G Farm in Chilton County, Alabama, here to talk to Miss Catherine about her new adventure, which is in, I'm gonna let her tell you cause I'm gonna get something wrong, but here she is. Hey, hey Catherine. How are you? I am good, how are you? Good. Well, um, I told you I'd like to come over and just talk to you about your newest adventure. Sure. And um, if you don't mind, I'd like to sit down and hear, hear what you've got to say about your newest, newest adventure. Sure, well, let's, let's go talk. Your newest adventure, what is it? Well, I am a wildlife rehabber for baby deer. For the state of Alabama. For the state of Alabama. Did y'all hear that? A wildlife rehabber for baby deer. Okay, first of all, what I found out is that Catherine is the only wildlife rehabber for deer in Alabama. Yes. So this means up until this point, there was no rehab for no. baby deer. No, sadly, if there was an orphaned deer or one that was injured in an accident on a highway, then either the game wardens would put them down, meaning euthanize, or they would put the orphan ones back into the forest in hopes that another doe would adopt, which sometimes they do if mm -hmm. there's a big herd there, but they would hope that they would adopt or nature would take its course. So that was a lot of deer that had absolutely no hope. No hope. No hope. So what you're doing is you are providing a place for individuals, for game wardens, yes. for veterinarians, yes. For anyone in the state of Alabama that needs help with a baby deer. Absolutely. You can't take a big deer or a... I can't take them past four months old. I, that's the law. That's not your that's, choice. That's the law. Okay. Yes. Because if I could, I would. But the reason for that is after they're four months old and if they're injured or... Uh, which they should be eating by then so they wouldn't be orphaned. But if they were injured... Um, natural deer behavior is not to let you touch them. 
Okay. So it would be very dangerous to me. It would be dangerous to anyone trying to get the deer. And Certainly. so if they're to the point of they're going to let you touch them, then they're to the point of death anyway. But fawn deer are different. They will let you touch them. Because do they actually imprint? Yes, they actually imprint. And that's part of where your instincts as a human come in to not let yourself get too close Absolutely. to that baby because you would obviously become its mother. Right. So when they come to live here at G&G &G Farms for uh, four months at the most, um, I take a lot of caution in not letting them imprint. And so, you know, the first few days, yes, I need to get them accustomed to taking a bottle because you can't just put them straight on milk or, or what we use in this case is a goat milk replacer. But you can't just do that because then you're going to give them chronic diarrhea, then they're going to um, pass away anyway. So what I do is I give them 24 hours of Pedialyte. Okay, Pedialyte okay. first. Pedialyte first. Then after 24 hours, that first bottle is going to be three-quarter Pedialyte, one-quarter milk replacer. To get their gut used to. Yes, slowly. They... So most of the time um, when the deer come to see me, they're dehydrated anyway. When we get to the point where they've got a whole bottle of milk, that's when, you know, I start a regular schedule feeding with them. And by that time, they've, you know, kind of started to accept that they're going to be getting milk from now on from a bottle. Gotcha. So they start, and I start them off slow. I don't want to overfeed them because it's a whole lot better to underfeed than it is to overfeed. You can give them diarrhea just from overfeeding. So it's a whole lot better to uh, underfeed than to overfeed at first because if you do feed them too much because they'll take they'll take more than they need then they're going to get diarrhea that way and then you have to kind of start all over with the pediatrics That's right. so you don't want that to happen because you want them to be getting their proper nutrition if they don't get enough protein or proper nutrition then they can get stuff like metabolic bone disease and different disease processes that they won't live through so you kind of have to know Create with that perfect balance. Yes, it's a perfect balance. Um, matter of fact, and, and you had said a minute ago, and I meant to elaborate on this, that I take them from, you know, anywhere from game wardens to veterinarians. I did get one from a veterinarian. I have a little doe right now that came from a veterinarian. Because believe it or not, it's illegal for a veterinarian to even possess a baby deer. You have to be a licensed wildlife rehabber yes. in order to do this. Yes. So up until this point, even a veterinarian had to euthanize if there was, yes. you know, if there was no, which there was no one to take care of, of deer. And you will see now that there is a wildlife rehabber in the state of Alabama, that people will actually drive to bring the deer to you because they don't want these baby deer put down. I don't either. Certainly. And so, you know, I am authorized to go and pick them up now. So, you know, it's one of those things where um, it takes, and, and the reason I think that there's not a lot of wildlife rehabbers is the process that you have to go through. Well, it's strenuous, and you and I talked through the entire application process yes. that you went through, and, and so to speak, it was a headache. It was a headache. It, yeah. It's not something that everybody has the well, first of all, the heart to do, but second of all, the mindset to want to go through to get to where you are now. Well, you really have to have the heart for it and really want to do it to continue the process because um, when I first started looking at doing this, it was back in like February. And then I just kind of put it on hold because it was a lot to it and I needed to focus on the farm the pasture, the bow range, and different projects. Get your ducks in a row yes. before you. I needed to be able to focus on the babies when they're here. And so it just wasn't good timing. So then I revisited it and it's been um, now probably three months ago because two months was the whole process. That That's, that's it's amazing because they are really going through the steps to make mm -hmm. sure everybody that does this dots their I's and crosses their T's. They're Absolutely. not just letting anybody off the street. That's You've right. got to know your stuff before you can do this. Well, you know, um, I am 
you know, my career was as an RN, I'm a nurse, right? And so basically nursing animals is kind of similar to nursing people. So back to milk. Yes. Okay, so it's not like you can go out and just milk a, a doe, meaning a deer in the wild. No. <laughs> and it's not like you can just go to the grocery store and use cow's milk because that's a definite no-no. Cow's milk will ruin their gut on the first time it's given to them. So what do you do as far as milk replacement? I use, um, I, I go to the tractor supply and I actually use the do more. I think it's do more. Goat milk replacer. Goat milk replacer. Goat and kid milk replacer. So if you guys are in any way familiar with deer, their closest relative is probably the goat. It is. We, we call them the goat of the woods. The goat of the woods. So therefore the goat milk kid replacer is what you use in making your bottles. Yes. All right. Part two to this is the state does not provide any financial assets to you taking care of the wild deer. No. Um, I, you know, the whole process was going to the vet and getting your letter of support, going to your county commissioner, getting your letter of support and going to the health department and getting vaccinated. So I had to get vaccination. Vaccinations for what? Tetanus, believe it or not. Okay, so you deer, had to be current on the tetanus shot. Yes, deer carry tetanus sometimes. Okay, so, so just like goats. Yes, just like goats. So I had to be current on my tetanus. And then only after that is when I went to the state to take the exam. Okay. And it was a proctored exam at the Wildlife Services Center in Montgomery. So this is a lot of time off your clock. It is. It is. To get to, to the point where you could actually take care of a, a deer. Yes. And you didn't know if you were going to be approved in the end. Well, after they approve and you've passed your test, then you have to start building your enclosures. And they are certain specs. <laughs> they do not supply materials for that. They do not supply... Um, they, they don't supply anything because they tell you you're on your own. You're on your own. This is going to cost you a bunch of money and you know nobody wants to do it because you know the enclosures being built, the stalls being built to their specifications uh, because they have to be for baby deer six foot tall. Wow. Yes. Because they can obviously jump. jump. Yes. Oh so, my goodness. No. They don't supply that and they don't supply milk. They don't supply wound care supplies, nothing. The number one thing that has happened to you is you get calls from people that say, I found the baby deer mm -hmm. in my backyard or on my property mm -hmm. and it's not moving. Yes. And that's natural. That's natural behavior. That's it's natural. not going to move. It's yeah. supposed to be there. It's going to lay down as flat as it can with its ears flattened out and look. You may think that that, that is an indication that it's um, in poor health, but probably more times than none, it's perfectly healthy. Yeah, it's perfectly healthy unless they've already taken it in their house and they've kept it for a week and they fed it cow's milk from the refrigerator and now it's sick. And then it... it, it and then they want me to help. That it may be too too late. Sometimes it is. Yeah. So number one rule is if you find a deer on your property or in the wild and it's laying there and it's a baby, leave it alone. Leave it alone. How long do you say let pass before you check on it again? Leave it alone and watch it. Okay. If it's in the same place and that doe has not came back in two days time, Let's get the deer and get it some food. The mama may be dead. Or but you, don't you, mean, see, you don't mean stand there and watch it. You no, mean watch it from a distance. Distance, because the mama won't come back around if you're standing there. Yes, leave it alone. Watch it from a window or... Get you some binoculars. Binoculars is good. Who and how in most states do people go about reaching out to somebody like you? Well, I am on the website, OutdoorAlabama.com. They can uh, go on there and get the list of rehabbers. I'm the first one on the list because I'm the only deer rehabber in the so, state of Alabama. OutdoorAlabama.com if you're in Alabama. But I'm sure that every state, every state has their website. Well, I tell you, I, I have learned so much about just the whole life cycle of deer from, from this little tidbit that we have talked about today. And I hope you guys have too. 
but my number one reason for coming out here is 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 to help this lady raise some funds and to help her get some supplies that she needs to do what she's doing if you have a front financial burden and you're not able to donate just keep Catherine in your thoughts and prayers and prayers please yes, yes because this is something that's near and dear to her heart and without help from others she's not going to be able to continue to do what she does well I and mean, I commend you for doing for doing this and one thing I didn't say earlier is Catherine currently has two babies here that she's taking care of they cannot be shown on camera and that is that is by law by law yes um we're standing at the barn that has yeah they're them. they're on the other side here but by law she cannot go in and show you guys the deer i don't know what the reason is for that well um for one thing you know if there's a lot of people around the deer they can imprint and we want to keep them wild and keep them wild. that is my motto keep them wild and um I respect that. I totally yeah. respect that. Besides the fact that you have a PayPal account that you can monetarily donate to, you have an Amazon wish list that I'm going to post in this video. Actually, not me, Jason. And it shows a list of things that if you feel led to donate to Catherine, you can buy those things on Amazon and it will be shipped to her to me, yes. at your cost, of course, to help what she's doing here. Abs absolutely and if they're prime members it'll ship for free of ship course. for free yes so nothing is too too large or too small i mean one dollar is greater than oh, zero dollars yeah. and i appreciate you so much i mean this is just an honor and a blessing just to be able to for you to be here today doing this she she knows what she's doing she has a huge heart and i, I just can't tell y'all how much i appreciate what she's doing and I hope you do too. You don't have to be from the state of Alabama to, to see what she's doing and respect her for trying to help these animals. Because as you know, I'm a huge animal lover and that includes everything. Um, everything, everything that lives and breathes has my heart and it does Catherine as well. well. I thank you so much. Well, I thank you for having us and I hope that everybody here learned a little something and well, if anybody ever has any question about deer behavior or about the life cycle of a deer, they can always send me a message and I'll be happy to explain anything. Thank you, Catherine from G&G &G Farms and um, get back to feeding those babies. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it's feeding time again. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> this has to be the fastest freeze dry process that I've ever done. All right, so I actually warmed the trays. Oh my. It tastes just like basil. It tastes like fresh basil. That's what I should have said. It doesn't taste like dry basil. It tastes like fresh basil? It tastes just like fresh basil, not dry basil. Yeah. You know, dry basil has that, that dry flavor. Just don't. Tastes just like fresh it basil. Tastes just like fresh basil. Okay. So I'm glad I had enough to do a second batch because I'm about to pop that one in. Uh-huh. Don't you think if we rehydrate this by spritzing some water on it, then it'll bring back that fresh texture? Yeah, but I don't even know if you have to do that. You may even just crumble it up and put it in a jar and just kind of just sprinkle I it on your food. I want crumble, though. If I'm eating a flatbread pizza, I want to see that beautiful basil leaf sitting on the top. You can, but I think when you put this on the pizza, uh -huh. it's going to rehydrate itself. Okay. I don't think you got to do anything. Well, I'm very satisfied with the way it turned out. Mm -hmm. Because it's so thin, mm -hmm. this is not going to take much at all. So I think once you put it on something, it's going to it's gonna rehydrate pretty quick. Well, that's good. But I also, I wouldn't mind crumbling some up and putting it in jars. No, I wouldn't either. Or if either. you want it for soups or spaghettis or whatever. But you know what? Or even a sandwich. That's the joy of having two batches. Yeah. We can do what we want to. Right. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and enjoyed seeing the process of freeze-drying basil, along with seeing Catherine at her new adventure, which is a wildlife rehabber. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and y'all be good.